Hello everyone, this is Interview 360. I'm your host, Vanessa Kamatsi. Joining me today is Ambassador Julia Chang Block, a diplomat who rose to become the first Asian American ambassador in U.S. history. She is also the founder and president of the U.S.-China Education Trust, helping increase international understanding between China and the United States. Welcome to the show today, Madam Ambassador. It's so nice to see you. Great to be here, Vanessa. You have really opened the doors and blazed the trail for so many others. Well, it's something that I wanted to do and I felt that I had to do. It's a mixture of feelings because I always think that I can do more, uh, should do more, but at the same time, I think we've had some breakthroughs, Chinese Americans, that is, and I would add women uh, also. But are those breakthroughs enough? But there is a sense of satisfaction that we've had them. I can still remember how I felt euphoria when I heard about President Barack Obama nominating Gary Locke as our ambassador to China because I did not think that in my lifetime I would see that. You're the first Asian American ambassador in U.S. history. You've made history and you have opened the doors for so many people and, and especially women working in government. I mean, you've really set that example. For Asian American women. But Again, I was possibly the beginning. What's really important is who follows. Uh, look at how many women were elected in this last midterm elections. And look at Elaine Chao. She's my friend. And you mentor her, actually, right? Well, yes, I'm old enough to mentor mm -hmm. her. I'm at least a decade older than she is. And look at what she's accomplished. Thank she you. has been, or she is still, uh, you know, the secretary of the cabinet, a cabinet minister, uh, officer, twice over. Let's talk about 1989 when George H.W. Bush mm -hmm. appointed you as ambassador to the kingdom of Nepal. Uh -huh. What was that moment like for you? I have to tell you the story <laughs> because, as I said, I never expected this. Uh, it was like a dream come true. Um, I remember exactly where I was. I was at that time a fellow <clears throat> at Harvard's uh, program on U.S.-Japan relations. I was walking in the, in the reception area and somebody called out my name, Julia Chang Block, telephone call for you. So I said, oh, okay. So, because in those days I didn't have a cell phone. <laughs> right, there and was so I, walked, I walked, walked up to the reception desk, you know, to the phone. And the receptionist said, it's a phone call from the White House. I said, oh, sure. I pick up the phone, and all I could hear was President George Bush. That's H.W. Right, senior. I said, oh, you're kidding me. And there was this laugh. And he, I basically, I think I heard, I am really President Bush. <laughs> and I want you to be my the next ambassador to the kingdom of Nepal. I think I heard that. <laughs> I mean, I blurted out something. I mean, it was unbelievable. And so it was, in a way, it was, it was like I really sort of <laughs> flubbed it. <laughs> but at the same time, it was a dream come true. And there's actually a funny story about once, so once you got there, there's a funny story about how you actually spent more time in the office of, of, uh, of the King of Nepal back when it was a monarchy. Well, um, look, I arrived in 1989, September, and at that time, Nepal was an absolute monarchy. So the protocol office came to uh, train us, all the new ambassadors, and said, you must remember this. The king will summon you, and you must bow when you enter his room. 
and you sit down only when he tells you to sit down. And when you depart, you must remember never to turn your back to the king. You must walk backwards until you're oh, out until of the you're room. Out of sight. And he will give you five minutes, maybe ten at the most. And you are absolutely to remain vigilant to his every wish. He will tell you when to speak. He will tell you when to stop, when to leave. I said, okay, we all said fine. I mean, the, the staff was much more nervous than we mm -hmm. because if something went wrong, they would get blamed. So we were on our best behavior. So I do as I'm told when I got my, uh, my interview. I think it was because, you know, he did not, he knew I, I am an, a Chinese American or Asian American. But somehow or other, he found that, I think, intriguing, that I would be the American ambassador. So he was curious. And so I could ask him a lot of questions, too. And we just started chatting. And I, you know, I, I had a sense that he was kind of lonely. So you were really sort of bonded with him then in your... Well, you could only bond so much with an absolute monarch because his staff protects him completely. Um, but... We but he remained, saw something in you. We remained uh, in communication. So, I mean, you know, I was the U.S. ambassador. That's wonderful. But don't you feel that you have had a part of that in really helping to, to open those doors? Because to be the first and to have made history huh? is, is a wonderful accomplishment. And I'm sure that, you know, was it a difficult path for you? To becoming ambassador? I don't think I would call it difficult. I would say that I never dreamed of the possibility. And that is, I think, where being the first is important. Because if others can see you and say, if she can do it, why can't I? But I did not have those mentors. Almost all my mentors have been men because in my generation, I mean, where was I to find an Asian American woman in diplomacy? Well, how much of a role, because I, I would like to talk about the relationship you had with your father in particular. Mm. Was, was that a, for you th that maybe role model who helped mold you in some ways? He was like a traditional fa Chinese father. He never said so much, but whatever he said, you obeyed. That is very Chinese. It's like the tiger father. Right. Uh, he didn't push like the tiger mother that we all know. But what he did was he just had exuded expectations. And but you did follow in his footsteps. Somewhere no question. In, <laughs> you you studied at uh, Berkeley and then was getting uh, your master's at Harvard. Sort of a nod to your father. And then what you studied also. Absolutely, because as I said, my father had expectations. If I ever bought, brought home less than an A, he would say, "What is this? Not good enough." I mean, the expectation was there in our family, that one of his children would go to Harvard. But you recall, Harvard was a school for boys. Correct. And in my day, it was still a school for boys. But then I could go to graduate school. You know, they allowed women to go to graduate school. Uh, and my father just never had to say anything. We all knew. And unfortunately, my brother, his grades weren't very good. So he probably would never be, be able to go to Harvard. So the expectation was laid on me. I, I was the oldest. Do you sort of now, you can sort of hindsight say, I'm so glad he did push me because this is who I've become? But it's more than that because I admired him. Um, my father was the first uh, Guns of Pequan, his Boxer Rebellion scholar to graduate from Harvard Law School. Wow. And that's the connection with Harvard. We didn't talk that much about it, actually. But 
once I learned about his history, his accomplishments, I felt here was somebody I can admire. Our foundation is called the F.Y. Chang Foundation. It's named after my father. And what it does, its first program, was to support any Chinese student who got into Harvard Law School. Okay. To give them some support so that they can be sure and get their degree. Um, there's a lovely photo I saw of you, and you were holding hands with Barbara Bush. Ah. And it was with you, and I believe it was your husband, ah, Barbara. Right, right. I met my husband at Harvard, and he is Jewish. My parents love him. He particularly loves my mother. But my father made absolutely no objections because he's not Chinese. Why? You can guess, because he's a Harvard man. So to him, to my father, my husband was OK. Well, that's a good thing, then. You always need that father, especially for the daughter. You yes. want your father's approval in that absolutely. sense. Absolutely, yes. absolutely, yeah. I can tell you a funny story about my husband. Uh, I was the ambassador, so he was the wife. In those days, they had an association for ambassadorial wives. They hadn't changed uh, the title to spouses. So when he was invited with the other spouses, uh, by Barbara Bush to tea, he looked at her and he says, do I look like a wife? <laughs> he, he said, I think it's time that you change the name of this association. So did it get changed? I don't know. <laughs> I hope so. Well, so how was he then in, in, in that bit of the role reversal? I mean, he's obviously hugely uh, successful himself. But was it, you know, because at the, like you said, we're, we, this was a, a long time ago and things were so different. So you were mm -hmm. in the forefront of that. How was oh, that? Oh, my, my husband is my support. I couldn't do what I do without him. And this is what I tell a lot of uh, young girls that I mentor. Beware who you marry. It makes a difference. And my husband is the most self-confident man there is. We're completely in different spheres. Uh, so, you know, we respect each other's accomplishments. And he builds you up. He builds me up. He does not tear me down. That is so wonderful. No question. So lucky. And to have met him, you know, back And at said, Harvard. Right. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Um, Senator Charles H. Percy of Illinois, mm -hmm. when you were starting your career, mm -hmm. he had a very huge impact yes. with your career. Well, Senator Charles H. Percy was the golden boy in his day. He was a politician with integrity, and I stress that. You know, we could use a few more like him today. He started my career because to tell you the honest truth, I wanted to work on the Hill. I'm fascinated by politics. Unlike most Asian Americans or Chinese Americans, I hate math. I, I, I'm not a good model for STEM students. <laughs> uh, and I love politics and foreign affairs and, you know, all you that. You knew that's what you always yes. wanted to do. Well, in those days on Capitol Hill, you didn't see hardly any women, not to mention minority women. And I pounded the pavement, so to speak. Uh, one Californian senator, who will go nameless, uh, his office told me, wow, we have a lot of Asian American constituents. And we have never had an Asian American apply for a job here. So here I thought, oh, this is going to be good. And they said, we would love for you to be our receptionist, then everyone can see you, that we support Asian Americans. I thought to myself, I won't say what I thought exactly, but I thought, I didn't go to Harvard to become a receptionist. Senator Percy was before his time. He was a feminist before his time. I was very fortunate to be part of his staff as he headed the delegation to the first International Women's Year in Mexico City in 1975. Oh, wow.
So he really was that sort of that person that really opened those doors Absolutely. for you. Absolutely. Because he, because he gave me confidence. He opened the door and he didn't care. You are also the president and founder of the US China Education Trust. Why did you decide to establish this organization? Because um, Peking University in 1998 invited me during their centennial uh, to go on campus and to be a whatever, really I, whatever I wanted. And I was absolutely captivated because I hadn't really gone back to China for any length of time since I left. Mm -hmm. And U.S.-China diplomatic relations didn't really officially begin until 1979, January 1st, right. 40th anniversary next right. year. Uh, so I jumped at the chance. And while on the campus, and I found that I loved teaching, I really this, loved the students. They were so bright. I taught in English because I could not teach in Chinese. My Chinese is something I regret losing. But I've slowly learned to speak some, but not, not, not good enough. But I realized, and it was during an interview like this, where the Chinese um, reporter pointed to me and said, you are a Chaoliang, meaning I was a bridge. And I didn't know what she meant at the time. So it got embedded in me that I could be a bridge. So U.S. China Education Trust was born. And are you using, what are you using um, as, as the bridge? Is it education? What is it that you want most having started this? It has to be education because education is fundamental. And that's why we're called the U.S. China Education Trust because education, I believe, is the foundation for everything. And that's really the tool or the key that you feel that women especially, through education, is what women must do. Absolutely. Because I worked for quite a few years on economic development. You know, I was with the Agency for International Development. And I would say categorically that the best, the most productive investment you can make in economic development is to invest in the education of girls and women. Absolutely. Ever since I started the U.S. China Education Trust, you've been. I go back now twice a year. We have actually uh, established two platforms. One is the American Studies Network with 54 member institutions, and the other is the Media Education Consortium with 38 member institutions. We are of associated with over 70 Chinese universities. Wow. So we're across the country. So you really are using that education as the tool to get everybody and as the bridge. I believe in it. It's been four decades since President Nixon went opening <coughs> up relations between the U.S. and China. How do you, how do you see those relations um, at the moment? Bad. Well, I will, will always want to keep my hand in U.S.-China relations because it is the most critical relationship in the world today. Um, if it goes bad, the whole world goes. Uh, so that is always. It, it was not uh, slow in coming. The problems always existed because the change in American perspectives about China is fundamental. It's not just a flash, because there has been uh, mistrust, mm -hmm. strategic mistrust building. Our cultures are so different, and now a rising China challenges America, and we all know what happens in history when that happens. What would you say you are truly most proud of in, in all of, of your work that you've done and, and in, in anything? I'm not sure pride is the word. I think it's a 
sense of accomplishment that um, the U.S.-China Education Trust uh, really began in 1998 <clears throat> when I went to Peking University. But we opened our office in 2004. So it's been 15 years. Um, and it, we've su survived. That alone, I think, is an accomplishment. So what's what's next for you? I feel like you're someone who who you just you continue. You have a lot of vitality and energy. What do you hope for for the future? What do you want to What do you want to do in the future? Life has seasons, and I'm in my winter season. So I would like to have some time to tend to my bucket list. I really want to do more traveling. To have more free time. Because, you know, one cannot stop learning and one cannot stop doing new things. So I want to find out what will excite me during the winter phase of my life. Well, that sounds like a lovely plan, but I do agree. I mean, I, I feel that if you are constantly, it's so interesting that you say that part. If you always are challenging yourself by learning, you're always using your mind and your creativity, mm. and so you always keep getting better no matter, no matter the age. Well, thank you so much for being here today. It's been so wonderful speaking with you. Vanessa, I really enjoyed talking to you. And thank you for watching Interview 360. We'll see you again next time.